It's not going to be a long meditation, just to... But you want to be comfortable enough so that you don't have to worry about your body. So I thought that it would be nice to... to because we're going to talk a little bit about uh, this, the, the vow ceremony itself today. And some of the preliminary things that need to happen before the ceremony. and. I thought it would be fitting to actually do the preliminaries, which is uh, a meditation. It's it's a meditation that is actually meant to be a preliminary step before meditating in the Tibetan Buddhist lineage. But um, being a long-time meditator myself, and when I began to do these preliminaries years ago, I started to think that uh, they were, those preliminaries themselves, one of the most amazing, most profound meditations that I, I've ever come across. And I always feel also often too like the teachers they trick us into doing this and then doing that and you know by saying okay well this is a preliminary you know, this is a preliminary that you would do before you actually meditate and in so tricking us into doing it every day and secretly knowing how important it is or c or can be so here we go For a few moments, watch your breath. I'm going to wait for whoever's coming in. Hi. We're just going to start meditating, so just come in and sit down. Enjoy. So take a few moments to feel the heaviness of your body, whether your body meets the cushion, meets the earth. Relaxing into that sensation. It's helpful to do that, to pull your mind into the present moment. One of the many ways that we can just relax into the present moment. It's so important. You take a deep inhale and use that inhale to lengthen, reaching the crown th towards the sky. And then as you exhale, you try and keep that drawing upwards, that gentle drawing upwards of the crown, but you're going to relax your shoulders so you feel like you're uplifted, open and ready. But you're also relaxed, so your heart feels open. Make sure that your brow isn't furrowed. This shouldn't be uh, an effort thing. We're not doing this meditation with our face. So you can just relax your eyebrows, relax the jaw, and it, it helps to think of having an inner smile. So what may even happen is the corners of your mouths might turn up a little bit, which will brighten you up on the inside. And then take a few moments just to simply watch your breath at the tips of the nostrils, so as the breath passes the tips of the nostrils. It can be helpful if you try to detect sensation there. So you send your mind there and just try to be aware of the sensation of the breath passing 
the nostrils to bring your mind into focus. Bringing your mind here and now. So now we move into the official preliminaries, the preparation stage for meditation, which in itself is a, is a beautiful meditation, which you could do daily and get great results from. So in your mind now, you're going to call to you your teacher. Now, you may not have someone right now in your life that you would call your quote unquote teacher in, a, in an official way. You may not have asked someone to be your teacher, but it's easy for us to find someone who we would see as a teacher. And this being that you call to you could be someone from a historical figure, Mother Teresa or Jesus or uh, from any, any religion. Muhammad, it could be from any religion. There could be someone in your life now that you see as being very wise and you would like to emulate those qualities. It could be your mom or your dad. Anyone who you would see as a teacher. And then you call them to you, you call them to you in your mind and they appear. And it's nice to consider that it's not like they appeared, it's more like you finally notice them or you just notice them and that they're always there. They're always there watching you and loving you. So you see them hovering in the air in front of you sitting in full lotus, floating in the air. And do your best to see them in full color. Sometimes it helps to draw an outline and fill it in if you have trouble visualizing it. There are those who can visualize easily and if something pops up, there are those who, who, who don't and theirs is more a feeling or it could be just some colors um, both of them work but everyone will get a sense of something a feeling is just as good as an image maybe even you know it, it's going to be it's going to be useful and perfect whichever one uh, kind of person that you are So you feel the warmth and love from this being. And you feel like you can relax around them and that they know you. And they've known you since time with no beginning. And all they really want is for you to be happy. That's what they want from you. They don't want anything from you except your happiness. So in your mind, see yourself make three prostrations to them, bowing to them three times. Maybe you place your forehead on their toes or something nice like that. These preliminaries can be very fun and personal. You get to fun to do them the way that your heart is inspired each day. The next thing we do is we make an offering. So you put something in your hands and offer this to your teacher, to this holy being. It could be elaborate, 
It could be worlds, it could be piles of gems, it could be music. The highest offering that you could give your teacher is your practice. That you put into practice what they've taught you. So your offering could be, yeah, I meditated today. And you're like, yeah, you're stoked about this meditation. You put it in your hands and you offer it. Or a bouquet of flowers. And they're always happy to receive. And then you make a confession. You tell them what's on your mind. You think of something that in the last 24 or 48 hours that you wish you had done differently. And you have this sense that they know anyways. They already know. So you just tell them. And you see that there's no judgment. They're happy that you confessed. And then you tell them something that you're really stoked about that you have done in the last 24 or 48 hours. Rejoicing in the virtue that you have done. So you tell them about something that you, you're happy that you did or are doing, you know. And then tell them about something that someone else is doing or has done that you're happy about. So-and-so is doing this right now. Isn't that amazing? So-and-so did this. I'm so happy and amazed that they did this. Rejoicing in the goodness of others. Very beautiful, holy practice. And then you ask your teacher to stay. Please stay. Please stay with me until I reach total enlightenment. It's nice to add, please, please stay and help me see you. Teach me how I can always see you. And then you say, please teach me. Please teach me in ways that I can clearly understand. And if you happen to be teaching me through a song on the radio, please help me know that it's you. Please teach me in all the ways that you can and help me receive. And this holy being, of course, agrees and is very excited that you've asked all these things and made these offerings. And they rise up in the air and shrink down in size to about the size of your thumb. And they spin around in the air to face the same way you are and then alight upon your crown. And as they rest on your crown, feel the the warm glow of them there. And then see that they melt into golden light and melt into your crown. And maybe you'll feel them come down through your central channel, down through your center, and then reappear in your heart. And then it's nice to make a place in your heart for them. And since the deep inner recesses of your heart, beyond time and space, you can play around here and make them a palace. Anything that you would like to 
make for them. Maybe it's a lakeside cabin in your heart. Maybe there's music and birds, but they're happy there. And then they're so happy that you've invited them into their heart, your heart, and from the act of doing their, doing their preliminaries, they begin to glow very brightly inside your heart until light bursts out of the pores of their skin and fills your heart, and then this light bursts out of your heart and fills your body with golden light, and then this light bursts out the pores of your skin and touches the heart of every being and you wish them happiness may all beings have happiness and no suffering and then the light withdraws back into your own heart back into your Lama's heart inside your own heart and they where they stay and you can have them there all day Ready? Open your eyes. Now that, my friends, is a kick butt meditation. <laughs> That's got, because you can take that meditation and every aspect of that meditation, you could, you could be doing that meditation and stop anywhere and look at the Lama or look at the teacher and just take in you know, the, their presence or even consider, you know, why would I make an offering? Or why would I confess? Or like, it, it's, it, it's a great practice. But they say that it purifies negative, it purifies obstacles, and it amasses merit. That that one meditation, and it has a way of uh, making the divine leap into your normal life. You see it everywhere. Would you mind just moving over so I can actually see you instead of hiding behind Yasmin? Yeah. <laughs> Not that you're riding. <laughs> How are you doing? Good. You made it just in time. Very? You made it just in time for the meditation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah, yeah awesome. Um, so that, you know, if you have a daily meditation practice, they, you know, the Tibetan Buddhists, they say that, you know, if, if your meditation practice is struggling, then the reason is that you're not, you're not doing your preliminaries sweetly. Um, and that you won't gain, you won't get great results from meditations if you don't do these preliminaries. Um, you know, and, and that's empty like everything else. That's, that can't be a hard and fast rule, but mm, I, I can say from personal experience that I found the preliminaries extremely helpful in my, uh, my daily practice, big time. They have a way of softening your heart and um, igniting reverence inside you. You know, igniting reverence, igniting gratefulness. And I don't, I can't think of too many more beautiful ways to live than reverent and grateful. Because if, if, you know, if you have reverence and gratefulness inside your heart, then it's not about the places that you go, you know. You don't have to go to a castle on a hill and see some holy being on a chair to be reverent or to be grateful. Because the, you have the reverence and the gratefulness in your heart. You can have gratefulness and reverence um, for your boss at work, for your daughter, for your brother for your friends, for yourself. Because these things don't come from outer objects. That's the whole point. The whole point is to um, is to have the light that is inside of you 
like lighting up your world so that you can think of it like that you can think of like you can think of that you have a spotlight or you have you are the projector of your life and uh, if the light that is coming from your heart is shining a, a murky dull <laughs> dull picture on things then things won't be very bright right because we talked about things being empty right we talked about things not having self nature you know that um, that this this object you know isn't a pen from its own side something right so it's a nice way to think about it too it, like it's like there's something in your mind that's like seeing this in a certain way and if that if that light that you shine upon this object whatever it is this this potential you could think of that this this object is just potential you could think of it like that in a way and the light from you provides the rest and if the light from you is reverent and grateful then you'll then what you see are things that inspire reverence and gratefulness in you. Even you can you can cultivate it to the point by doing your preliminaries daily um, to the fact that you can have grateful you can be grateful and have reverence for someone even if they're doing something that in a worldly way may look like um, they're trying to irritate you. Or hold you back, or pin you down, right? And you and you have maybe other people saying to you, you know, you know, Johnny, why are you putting up with that? The guy's a total jerk. But in your mind, that's not what you see at all, because you have this thing in your heart, and like that is such an important aspect of Buddhism. Is that is that there is no thing in your world, there is no thing in your world that you see that is independent of your involvement in it in order for you to see it the way it is and that's it, you know and how and because that's true then they go okay well then all right how do we take that truth and use it how do we take that truth and make it work for us that's where morality comes in. That's where your vows come in. They get, the vows are a way to simply guide your mind into thinking in certain ways that will f bring out this, this gratefulness, this reverence, this understanding, this wisdom that you then shine upon your world that you see. Because it doesn't come from nowhere. The, the beauty that you see or the ugliness that you see doesn't come from nowhere it's not this random thing it's it's from it's the fruit <laughs> it's the fruit of what we've done in the past and one of the one of the benefits or one of the beauties of the Bodhisattva vows is it is said that well, for one thing, <coughs> no one can keep them perfectly. You should, like, not worry about that right away. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, if the person that can keep the bodhisattva vows perfectly doesn't need bodhisattva vows. Uh, it's it's in the trying. It's in the trying that transforms you. In the same way that if you want to learn any kind of skill, it's in the trying that that, that turns you into what you become. So it's not like you're going to get handed 65 vows and out of the gate you're going to be like this perfect bodhisattva because that wouldn't make any sense at all. There would be no point in us even sitting here. Um... So yeah, they're beautiful, and 
I don't remember the exact quote from scripture, but they say that um, keeping the Bodhisattva vows even somewhat, uh, keeping the Bodhisattva vows somewhat poorly is more merit than somebody who has the ability to offer uh, a universe to a holy being. There's a lot. There's a lot of punch to those voices. It's your. It's your intention. It's your intention. Um, everything is about your. How, what is your intention as you walk through the world? And we need help with that. We need it. We need a guidebook, right? We need our Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, right? <laughs> Don't panic. <laughs> we need a little bit of help. Bring your towel. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk today a little bit about um, the ceremony itself. And uh, if you do choose to take your vows, you don't have to worry about anything. You don't have to like think that you have to know what the ceremony is. Like you have to memorize the ceremony and show up and do all these things <laughs> by memory. Uh, you'll, if you do take the vows, say it's a beautiful ceremony. Um, you'll be guided through the whole thing. All you, all you have to do is show up, clean. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's fun because uh, usually there's a group of people and. Um, that are taking them at the same time, and everyone usually gets together and has fun, and, and you clean up the room, and you make a mandala offering. So everybody usually brings them, you make this nice mandala, everybody gets together and has fun, and they, and they go in the back room and do this mad thing, and they come up with this crazy offering that's to the, to the, to the, you line with this, giving the vows as like respectful request with this mandala, and it's a lot of fun. If you go for that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and you invite, all your, you invite all your friends and people come and cheer you on and stuff and some people will come and actually um, renew their vows which actually rem brings me to this, uh, something I want to say so most people here know Farah right Yeah, she's uh, one of the angelic beings that hang around here to pretend to be normal sometimes um, <laughs> Uh, she has offered that if anybody wants to do, if anybody's doing homework, she has offered to mark the homework. She's made an offering to mark the homework, and she's also telling everybody that every day, not every day, every Saturday, she goes to Shakti, which is on Main Street, from 12 to 3.30, I think it is? 12.30 to 3.30. 12.30 to 3, thank you. And she does her homework. And it's, so if you, you know, feel like joining in and doing some homework with Farah at Shakti, she'll be there every Saturday from, what, 12.30 to 3.00. Yeah, so uh, she emailed me and said, please tell the class that, so now the whole world knows. <laughs> what is she studying? Is she studying too? Well, right now she's actually studying ACI 3 with Mariska, right? Okay. Mariska's teaching ACI 3 right now. It's a meditation, of course, on meditation. Yeah. All right, so we just need to talk about. Do you guys remember? I think we talked about this last time. But the two great divisions of bodhicitta. What is bodhicitta, anyways? The wish to become enlightened, to help, or the sake. For the sake of all suffering. Yeah, that's th that's just as a, an aside. That's what that's what uh, distinguishes. There's the, the Mahayana path and the Hinayana path, right? The Hinayana path, they call it the, there's the greater way and the lesser way. It's not that one is, you know, it's not that there's the, the, the lesser way is like a less way, like, like, like losers do it or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like that at all. It's just that uh, if, you, if you said, I have, the wish, I have the wish to reach enlightenment and just stop right there, that would be Hinayana. Your motivation is more for yourself alone, and uh, their their actually their enlightenment is 
is different too. So to a Hinayana person, if they reach enlightenment, then they've reached like Nirvana is enlightenment to them. Where the Mahayana, the greater way, is what distinguishes it is they tagline for the sake of every living being, right? So the that's why the Bodhisattva is the Mahayana practice, the greater way, because they're trying to do it for themselves, but also for the sake of every living being, so they can help everybody and be this this amazing helper, right? The Bodhisattva, the Bodhisattva, their whole trip is like, how can I help? How can I help more? How can I help better? How can I help more? How can I help better? How can I help more people? How can I help more people better? And uh, that's what the the six perfections are all about, and the vows are all about is is to get this thing in, in you know. It, it's interesting because you have this wish, and then what happens after a, a while is you then the karma arises to see yourself doing that. It's quite a joy to see yourself helping people and not be like the healthy all the time, right? And you go your whole life always like, you know, me, 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 I got this problem, I got that problem, and then something happens. You take, you do this spiritual practice, there's a transitional phase, and then all of a sudden, where did your problems go? They don't, they're not there anymore. And all of a sudden, because you've gained a certain understanding, you're helping other people with the problems that they have. And it cycles like that. And then you help them become helpers. Um, so, yeah, bodhicitta. Marge just said it nicely. Do you remember the two great divisions of bodhicitta? The wish? The two great divisions of the wish? The wish and the action. Or yeah, the, yeah the, wish and the, the wish in the form of a of prayer. Wish, yeah. And the wish in the form of action, right? So, even, you know, they, they say that the wish in the form of action is taking the vows. That's action. That's like, okay, I'm going to do something about it. In the form of a prayer, it's like you, you, you know, you wish that you could do something about it. You wish that you could. And um, there are various, there are varying degrees of that. And you'll feel it in your heart as time passes your wish um, because the ultimate form of that wish is a very a high attainment actually if you achieve the ultimate form of I have the wish even in the form of a prayer but that would mean that would mean that you had reached this state where you got on the bus and you understood very succinctly and directly the trouble that everyone's in and your compassion for them would be overwhelming and you would love like they were your only child every single person on the bus whether they were uh, smelly homeless right or someone in pearls it, you're, it would be equal exactly equal not one iota more or less exactly equal and um, there is a I guess we'll talk more about this in, in uh, for some of the other classes but there's a specific thing that happens when you study emptiness enough and you keep your morality enough and you actually have a direct perception of emptiness in and around that time you have you have a direct experience of bodhicitta and it, what, it, what happens is your heart actually finally, your, your heart finally cracks open for reals. It, it actually cracks open. And in that moment, you see every living being. And you see how every living being, if they happen to be suffering, is suffering and why they're suffering. And after that moment, you understand that you will spend the rest of your life um, trying to help people reach the place that you have reached. And that's all that you uh, want to do at that point. Your, your mission becomes that. And then whatever shape your life takes after that, that is always behind it. 
doesn't mean you have to teach Buddhism. You could get that. You could that could happen to you, and you could end up um, being an accountant. With it doesn't mean that you're going to run around and teach. It just it just could mean that behind you is this great love, and when people come to you with um, their troubles, you're going to give them an answer that will help get them out of their suffering, not out of their problem. You see, that's there's a big difference. You see, a, a lama or a teacher who has been that far with their mind is not is not interested in your petty problems. Not not saying that your problems are petty. Is not interested in in solving the forever bloody undulating roller coaster of many problems and 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 many problems and many victories. They're not interested in that at all. All they're interested in is teaching you how to get off of that roller, co roller coaster completely and get out of samsara and into nirvana. That's what they. That's all they want for you because they understand that as that is the only thing that's going to work out. So, if someone reaches that place, that person is a bodhisattva, like an actual card carrying. Bodhisattva for reals. And if that if that hasn't happened yet, then you're like um, you're an aspiring bodhisattva. And you know you know they're they're nice because they 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 let us take our vows and they say oh, you're a bodhisattva, but you're not really a bodhisattva, not yet. You're you're acting like one so that you can become one, right? You're doing your scales on the piano until you can pl really play the piece. <laughs> you have to. You have to do the scales first. And then you have to, you know, it's such a great thing like this because the Bodhisattva has to take it to task. You have to take your spiritual practice into the world. It's like, a, from a musician standpoint, it's like you can sit in your basement in your, in your bedroom and you can learn all the scales and learn chords, but that's another thing altogether to go and play it in front of somebody. And all of a sudden, you know, you know, things get real for a second. When you go, when you go outside and and you know, play on stage, it's much different. And so it's this: the bodhisattva is is going on stage. The bodhisattva is taking their scales, and they're walking out into the world and and taking the hit, taking the heat, going through all the emotional ups and downs, and uh, doing everything in their bloody power to fight the tendency to be selfish and that's that is like a major accomplishment right to get over to get over self cherishing to get over selfishness you know that's why I mean this this whole there's 18 of these things <laughs> that are just like <laughs> How not to be selfish? <laughs> that's all they are. That's it. That's how. That's how bad we got. <laughs> it, uh, you know, proving like over and over again, proving it to us over and over and over again w how it is that selfishness has just caused all pain, and you got to stop. But the you know. It's so deep in there. It's so deep. But you can, but you can, you can root canal that thing, right, Marge? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's this? Must be from Marge, right? Yeah. Toothbrush. <laughs> all my, I have a, an assortment at home now. And they're, all <laughs> they're all from Marge. They're so long. <laughs> when they well, start you know, well, it's nice to have you know the, the waiting for you, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so Mar, you can root canal your. We should all be root canaling our selfishness. Um, and that's what it's that's what it's all about. It's like doing the opposite. It's like doing the opposite. Anger's a hard one <laughs> these days, even interrupting, but 
it's not just selfishness. It's all that. Well, it, it, it stems from selfishness. Yeah. Right? Everything, like, like all suffering in some way stems from selfishness. You know, anger, like the anger that hurts, right? Um, the anger that hurts others, that hurts ourselves. You, once you get, if you meditate enough, you'll be able to trace it down to selfishness every time. I want something. I want something or I don't want something. Right? I want this. Didn't get it. <laughs> I don't want this. <laughs> <laughs> like it, it anger is like the the manifestation, right? The, the manifestation of of the selfishness. And uh, yeah, it's amazing when you get you c get down to the the root of it. And it gets, it gets more and more subtle. That's the beauty of the Six Times book. And the beauty of this whole practice is if you do it, if you do it um, as best you can, you get to very subtle levels of your mind. You get, to, you, you get to see, like, you know, even as you're getting up to reaching nirvana and things like that, you know, you're seeing subtle subtle selfishnesses they just get smaller and smaller but they're there because like the ultimate expression of your spiritual uh, goal the ultimate expression of it would be like all selfishness gone and you would be experiencing yourself as a whole other kind of a being because we're used to ourselves in that way we're used to ourselves operating on that level and when elements of selfishness drop we feel the loss of that. We feel the emptiness of that, that being gone. And we experience it ourselves differently. You, equ you know, you equate your happiness differently. And you'd think we'd figure it out, right? Because how many times have you found yourself, like, you know, lost yourself? in helping somebody else. You know, um, one of the most like telling things of that for me was uh, like I was at Diamond Mountain University and it was quite, uh, I think it was in the desert, it was like late, it was like two in the morning or past midnight, it was dark out and we, it was a long day of service and classes um, and I was sitting about to go b back to my tent and the, someone came out of the temple and had locked their keys in the car. I remember her. She locked her keys in the car. And it was quite late. You know, and I was just all like, uh, I wanted to go to bed. Right? Uh, but then I, I, she, she showed up. You know, and I helped her get her keys out of her car. I took her coat hanger and some, uh, <laughs> <laughs> some, some persistence. It took about half an hour. She's so happy, got into her car. You know how that feels. And then, then I sat back down on the same bench. And I was so happy, right? Bef like before that, before that had happened, I was all like, oh, poor me, I just served all day and I'm tired. I just took amazing classes and now I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> I just took amazing classes from holy beings that are gonna save me from suffering and now I'm tired. I'm gonna go to bed now, poor me. <laughs> <laughs> Even, right? That's what we do, right? Um, but then here, here comes an angel and says, I have a problem. I need your help. Mm. It took me right out of myself. Greatest vacation you could ever have. Out of yourself. And that, then I, I put it together. I was lucky, lucky enough to sit down and go, wow. Look, I'm just elated right now. I just spent a half an hour just totally blissfully thinking about somebody else. It felt so good. And I know everyone here has experienced that. So why can't we, why do we need to be told? Why is our selfishness so strong that we need to be told that that's the way that that works? Right? Why can't we just, okay. <laughs> okay, John. <laughs> you were happy for 30 minutes of your life. What were you doing? Helping somebody else. Why is it so hard to make the connection, right?
funny. So, right, bodhicitta in the form of a prayer and then in the form of uh, <coughs> the action, right? Which is taking the vows and, uh, and, and trying, trying your best to keep the vows. That, that is the actions of a bodhisattva. And uh, just one thing to clear up, there's one, I think it was Aryan Agarjuna was saying, yeah, but he was saying like, um, sometimes they would do a ceremony where they would do one ceremony just to get the wish, and another ceremony to take the vows. So two separate ceremonies. And one school of thought saying, well, it's best to come, have a whole grand ceremony and say, please, you know, bless me that I may, that I may get this wish. Please. And then run away for six months and just concentrate on getting the wish and then coming back and taking another ceremony and actually taking your vows. Um, so, and Jason Kappa wants to clear up for us that that's good, but not but, I, but in the actual ceremony itself, the vow ceremony itself, both are there. Because in the ceremony itself, you do ask, you do ask, may I have the wish? And then you actually take the vows themselves. So they're both in the same ceremony. So the ceremony of today has both of those aspects in it. But Jason Kappa also wants to point out that it, he also believes and thinks it it's, would be powerful to to take take the vows in the form of a prayer and then go off and try and cultivate bodhicitta there's certain meditations that we do for that and then build up this momentum this steam and then come and take another ceremony and get the vows and he says that the vows would take hold a li with a little more firmness in your mind because you want them There's really something about if you have a sense of urgency and you and you want them and you have this understanding of what they are and why you would have them and, and the benefits of them, they take root deeper and quicker when, when that's but you just that's kind of logistics and kind of a homework question about they're, they're both in one ceremony, but it would also be good to do because I've I've seen people come in, in, at vow, vow ceremonies and just take take it in the form of a wish. I've seen that here. Um, right. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the parts of actually taking vows. And we're going to go over the preliminary. Say Jorwa. Jorwa means preliminary. And <laughs> the Buddhists, the Tibetan Buddhists, um, the preliminaries are always more important than the main event. There's this big bunch of, you know, da, 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 leads up to this main event, and the main event's just like over in a second. And I was thinking about that today, but it's very metaphorical for the whole Buddhist path. It's very cool. They, they, they get all excited and they do a lot of like preliminary work in many ways so if you think about some of you have been into uh, like ACI 1 and 2 and stuff like that and there's a three principal paths where you develop your renunciation you develop your view of like okay this worldly way of living and chasing after things is leading me into pain and everybody else into pain. I've got to change my mind. I've got to figure out why it is that serving others is going to be helpful for my enlightenment. And and that leads into this bodhicitta where you think, well, how am I, how am I going to help everybody? Well, i got to become enlightened. How am I going to help everybody for real? Become enlightened. And then, and in and around all that, you're developing this wisdom. You're developing this unerring view of um, knowing over and over and over again that that this that this object and any object is not what it appears to be 
from its own side, whatever it appears to be for you at any point in time. So you're developing these things. And there's all these methods. And it's daily. So you could think of it as your life is a preliminary. And then when you see emptiness directly, when you have that pivotal moment, it's, it's 20 minutes. You don't even actually know because you're, you're gone from yourself when it does happen. When you have that, that pivotal moment that, that rebirths you into your next phase of existence, really. When you go through that doorway, when your mind goes through that doorway of seeing emptiness directly, then begins your next journey, you could say. You, are, you, are, you have become a different being at that point. You have become a lifetimes, eons have led to this one moment and you've become this different being. So, but before that little main event, preliminaries, years, days and years, preliminaries, and then you pop through there and then you have more preliminaries that lead you to the next thing, nirvana. Nirvana means like to blow out. To blow out what? What are you blowing out? Yeah, sorrow, pain, mental afflictions. Blow it all sorrow, blow it all, you know. Um, so it's very cool. So there, it's nice to think of your practice like that, right? You, you have to not burn yourself out and think you're going to like pull off the main event in three days. It's going to take some karma. It's going to take some daily loving. Right? Um, yeah. So here's the first part. Say Solwa Dabpa. This is requesting the Lama for the vows. This is the first part of the ceremony. So what about you? There's some parts about this. A, a person taking the vow can be ordained or not. So you can be an ordained person and take a vow or not. We're just getting into technica technicalities now. Um, should have at least some form of the wish to benefit others, even if it's in a wimpy, <laughs> even if it's a wimpy, wimpy wish. You have to have some form of like. You know, you're at least entertaining the thought that yeah, I could, I could be that. I could, I could be a helper. I'd like to be a helper. I think I can. I think I can, right? You know, like some, something like that should be in your mind. Um, and you should be intending to keep the three moralities. The three moralities. And what are they? No one here can tell me the three moralities. The three moralities are. Um, Vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry ice cream. <laughs> three moralities are Neapolitan ice cream. Because there's three flavors. There's three flavors to Neapolitan ice cream all together into one, and those are the three moralities. No one's going to debate me on that? No. No? no. But I don't what, you mean, oh, there's no there's no thing as Neapolitan ice cream? Is that what you're telling me? No. No, you're telling me something else. You tell, oh, you see, you're saying that Neapolitan ice cream is not the three moralities. Yes. Ah. So I guess then if it's not ice cream, the three moralities are something else. Yes. And okay, there's something else that uh, you can't tell me. Yes. Marge, you can't tell me because you weren't in last class. That's right. Yes. Okay. Then uh, since Marge can't tell me what the three moralities are, or that's what three moralities are, no one else in the class can. I think I can. Zoe can say what the three moralities are. <laughs> are they the sure. of speech or weight of thought, speech and action? No. Those are the three doors. Okay. Right? I could continue on this road for a while and do this debate style. We can, we can, but it might take 20 minutes. <laughs> that's, that's the beauty of debate because we just kind of hammer things around. But the, um, like the three, like the three, the, the, the ten non-virtues, right? Yeah. 
spe body, speech, and mind. Right? So you could say that we, you could say though, Zoe, yes. don't worry. Okay. You could say that you would use your body, speech, and mind to do the three moralities. There's, it's not that the body, speech, and mind are out of the equation. Yeah. They're definitely part of the equation, but they're not the three moralities. No one here can tell me what the first morality is. Is it the... Yasman! Is it the suffering of suffering? <coughs> the suffering of suffering. Does, so you're talking about the, the, the three sufferings. The three sufferings of three. Okay. We got lists flying around like crazy. Amanda's going to tell us what the three moralities are. Well, I might tell you one of them. <laughs> she might tell us one of them. Is it not harming any other living being? Like, not, but to be more direct, not killing your mother? Not killing your mother? One of those. Let's <laughs> <laughs> consider not killing your mother. It's one of well, the. See, one of the, see one everyone of the as, your, as has been your own mother, and then and then not harming any living being. Sounds nice. That would be really amazing if you could do that. I'm not sure, but it's morality, bad morality, and the first and the second one doing for another one. Ah, yeah. yes. Thank you. Yeah, the three moralities, you remember one, right? Avoiding bad deeds. <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Avoiding yeah. bad deeds was the first morality. That's right. Yeah. The second one was doing good deeds, right, to collect the merit. And then the third one was avoiding bad deeds and doing deeds for the sake of others. That's all. <laughs> Say that one more time. Avoiding bad deeds. Doing good deeds. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, you think of it this way: first morality is you're like not harming others, right? You're not you're you're not doing non-virtue. Second one is you're collecting merit. They say you're collecting merit. In other words, you're planting good karma. So you're you know, which is which is mainly what the bodhisattva vows are. Mainly, you're doing beautiful things in the world, collecting merit, collecting good. The third morality is not really a morality so much, but it's just um, you're doing both of the first two for the sake of every other living being. So then there, there comes your bodhicitta, right? So in order to take your vows, you should have some, some kind of intention of, of doing your best to keep those three moralities. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the vow giver. The vow giver uh, doesn't have to be ordained, but they say it's better if the person is ordained, but they don't have to be ordained. And it's also, they say, best uh, but not necessary if the giver of your vows can also give you your tantric vows. Tantric vows are very, uh, I can't really talk about them, but they're very um, interesting in that you don't get to study about the tantric vows. Like the bodhisattva vows, you, you understand them clearly, here's what they are, da 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 da. And the tantric vows, you're not allowed to study them before you take them. This is something about them. That's which I, we can't talk about in this class. But uh, you want to get your tantric vows if you can, if you can, and and you need a tantric lama to do that. But I shouldn't say you want to. I should say um, it would be beneficial, and it would speed up your progress to enlightenment. But again, I want to say that. Mm -hmm. That's not a hard and fast rule, right? I mean, it's just one of the ways. So, if you're taking bodhisattva vows, it's best to take it from someone that can also give you your tantric vows later, but not necessary. Can be male or female. And this person giving you the vows, they should also... Um, have the wish to help all living beings. It should be very obvious to you. This person that you, you, you want this person to be a certain kind of object, 
for you that you're taking vows from. It should be very clear to you that they are operating in the world because they want to help living beings. Um, you know, and, and, and that they're keeping their vows. There's a class, uh, I can't remember which class, I, I think it might be class two or class one, the, the qualities of the Lama, is that ACI one or two? One, one right. Um, you know, your Lama, your, your holy teacher that, you, that, that pulls your heart, you know, but often you don't know why, often it's undescribable, the reason. Like you're just drawn to this person, and uh, and then you begin to watch them, right? And you check them out and, and think, okay, could this person, you know, be my teacher? And there's we're not going to go into them now, but there's a list of like ten qualities, and and it's it's very rare to find someone with all ten of these qualities. So sometimes they, s they say that if you can't find someone with all those ten qualities, you should you know, maybe find someone that's at least got some of them. <laughs> but today's not the class to go into those ten qualities. Maybe we will, uh, maybe later on if your people are curious, we can go into that. Um, but bottom line, bottom line is they are steeped in kindness. <laughs> Yeah, that's like bottom line. You should you should look at them and just see, wow, now there is a kind being. It says also too that the vow giver, whoever this vow giver is, uh, should not have degenerated, degenerated the practice of the six perfections. Now, what do you suppose that means? What like what are the six perfections? What's the first one? Giving. Giving, right? Generosity, right? So if, if their generosity, this is what they say, if their generosity has degenerated, well, I'll put it this way. If their generosity or their giving hasn't degenerated, they're content with what they have, right? They don't need much. They're happy, right? No matter where they are, what situation they're in, what what food's in front of them, what kind of place they're living in, what kind of job they have, they're happy, they're content. If if um, their practice of the first perfection had degenerated, they're out in the world to gain worldly things, and that's they're consumed about getting things, and that would be someone whose first perfection had degenerated. And if their second per, per, uh, perfection, what's the second one? That's the third one. Mm -hmm. Second one? Kindness. kindness, right? And then they're not kind. They're not taking care of people. They're not being moral. They're not. Um, you know, they're harming people. They're harming people. So that would be like they've degenerated. What's the third one? Patience. Patience, right? So then, if if that had degenerated, then you would see them uh, like maybe on the edge of irritation a lot or something like that, or they're, they've lost their their patience. Like one of the qualities, one of the most amazing qualities of a holy teacher is their unbelievable patience. They're just so patient, you know, with you. No matter like, like one of the qualities, one of the one of the ten qualities is the teacher never gets tired of teaching you the same thing, <laughs> <laughs> the, and they don't, right? Um, until the person gets it, right? They're willing to sit down through eighteen binders that <laughs> 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 says the same thing in a different form. <laughs> really, the ideas, you know, they really do distill down to a few very, very powerful ideas. But because 
a holy teacher uh, has been through the difficult transition has been through what it takes to change the mind they 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 are happy to tell you again and again because they know the benefit they know the benefit of teaching you that to you they know the benefit of when you do get it and they know how hard it was for them because the ideas are so radical it's so crazy to all of a sudden be thinking that this pen is not out there it's a it's a mad insane reality changing radical bloody idea and you <laughs> and, and you need to think about it again and again and again and your lama you come to them with this problem they'll just say the same thing to you every single time they may you know shuffle the words around it but you'll notice after a while they tell you the same thing every time and it's always going to be of, about um, that's your karma forcing you to receive it that way and here's what to do you know um, here's how to not be selfish and then just that's it that's all I'm going to ever tell you because they're it's not their job to say, um, you know, take that job or this job. It's not their job. It's not their job to um, give you, like, relationship advice. If you go to them with relationship problems, they're going to tell you the same thing. <laughs> you say, well, <laughs> you can do this, then you can do that. You want to stay in samsara, you want to go to nirvana. Well, if you want to reach enlightenment, behave like this. Put them in front of yourself. Stop being selfish. <laughs> Anyways, um, so yeah, patience. The Lama patiently and lovingly says the same thing over and over again. So, you know, if they're grumpy and irritated and they look like they're ornery and stuff, maybe you don't want to take vows from them. Maybe, they're, maybe their third perfection has <laughs> gone down the toilet. Huh? <laughs> Fourth perfection. Joyous effort. Joyous effort. Man, have already just boom. She's ready to say it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you know, if if their jo if their joyous effort had degenerated, then suddenly, what? What would that mean? Do you think? Well, right. But how would it look? Do you think? If they if their joyous effort had degenerated, how, what do you think it would look like? They're rolling their eyes, Forced. they're hopping, yeah. mm -hmm. not authentic. Right, it kind of it, it kind of goes with patience, right? Because patience and joyous effort are very, mm -hmm. right? They're not having a good time. Right? They're not having a good time teaching you. They're not having a good time being a bodhisattva. They're not like <laughs> stoked about running around doing all these bodhisattva <laughs> things. <right? laughs> it's just like. Well, I guess I gotta be able to surf again today. <laughs> <laughs> what a pain in the butt. <laughs> right? That's funny. Fifth one. Stillness. Stillness, right? Commander's holding back now. <laughs> Stillness, right? Concentration. So, a con like so, so if 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 their concentration had degenerated, how do you think that would look? All over the place, ungrounded. Ungrounded, all over the place. Right, right. They would be like, they would be the kind of person that would go to meditate and they'd be like, <laughs> "What? I gotta have my emails." <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I was gonna watch this movie. I think I think I should watch the movie now. <laughs> right, no focus. Right. The number six. Wisdom. Wisdom. How would that look? You just would be. How would that look? <laughs> Do it, Zoe. Do it. One word. <laughs> you know what they say? This is like our, how do you answer that, right? How do you answer that question? Like, how do you know <laughs> that suddenly, <laughs> suddenly their, their wisdom is degenerated? Yeah. Right? How do you know that? Because they're still, right? Still. Right? Or like still, yeah, that. Still, still, yeah. still but for nothing. <laughs> no, what they say is they become spiritually stupid. <laughs> yeah. They, they become spiritually stupid. They, it means like they, that this person, has, has their wisdom has degenerated and they, they're spiritually stupid means like they're um, 
they're not they don't believe in the bodhisattva ideal anymore right they've kind of lost their view a little bit they even say that um, they lose the ability to memorize things like that where um, they just they like they've lost their their way you could say so all those things that were you, you don't want <laughs> yeah. right don't take your vows from a degenerate <laughs> I said, a degenerated bodhisattva right? so that's why you want to be careful you want to like because there's something about the power of the lineage there's something about the power of someone who's practicing sweetly and, and, and loves and is kind and is really doing their best to serve um, and they give you the vow it comes to you from a like you could say the river is pure it's not polluted right you're getting a a clear stream so and then and when you the, the person taking the vows and this is like I was mentioning before the fun part everybody gets together and um, there should be an image of the Buddha and some other and, and, and lineage, lineage lamas, pictures of lineage lamas. Like here, we've got a Buddha. We've had a lineage lama, la, lamas there, and uh, make the place very clean. A big part of taking a vow ceremony is cleanliness. You show up and you're wearing white. Right? You wear white to symbolize purity. Like here I am. You know I'm pure. I'm ready. And uh, the whole ritual of cleaning the place is like that. It just like uh, some of you have taken ACI no, ACI 3 is just happening now, but a big part of the preliminary practice is cleaning your room before you sit down. It's a nice you go and you, just even if it's just moving a few things, dusting here and there to make a nice sacred space. So you're making a sacred space for the vows to happen. Very clean and beautiful place. Um, and you show respect to the Lama, you make your prostrations and you um, you make the mandal offering I was talking about. Um, and then you request the vows three times. And remember, we're just going over this. As just, this will all be very clear at the time. If you want to do choose to take vows, it will all be very clear and, and laid out for you. You don't have to worry about this. But you take, you ask three times for the vows. You kneel, you kneel to receive the vows. They say that you, you, you bow down on one knee and, and you with your hands at your heart or your hands, you know, like this. They say you can also do the chicken crouch. They call it the chicken crouch, where you just like crouch, which I think is more comfortable to you. Do you have to go, Yasmin? Yeah, it's a little sick. Oh. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> chicken crouch. The chicken crouch is like this. Okay, we need to see it. Thanks. <laughs> 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 Right? Then there'd be like a line of people like this. <laughs> Usually there's like the front line of people taking the vows, and then there'll be like a back line of people that are refreshing their vows. Right? Like you might see Farah there coming and refreshing. Like it's cool. You just like freshen them up, right? Maybe they got a little dirty. <laughs> <laughs> cool. She'll be there, I'm sure. Yes, she probably will, and she'll probably. See you, Yasmin. Thanks for coming. Um, and then, you know, the Lama will will go through this cool thing where they uh, talk about the, the the value of the vows, get you all stoked up. Um, and then there may be a little explanation of some of the vows too, like a little little mini talk on the vows. Not so much in this situation because of the course, you know. You guys will know the vows very well, and there will be there. You don't need any explaining, but usually the the lama will say a few words about keeping vows. Some cool stuff gets said, um, and then there's yeah, this uh, lama says some things about what happens 
when you take the vows, the benefits, who's watching, and what the Buddhas are watching. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But. So that's like part of the preliminaries. And the second part of the uh, preliminaries, you could say, um, is called, it's called collect tsok. Say tsok. Tsok. is it you collect, it's like making a collection, a collection of a collection. You make a collection. <coughs> and then uh, you're, it's very cool. You invite all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas from all through the universe to come and come be here for this come witness this event. It's very cool to know all this stuff too, but we'll study m more, because when you come take your vows, you're kind of read, ready to be thinking about those kinds of things. It's a very holy ceremony. You invite these beings to come, and they come. And you can feel them in the room. Um, and you recall how, f you know, the qualities of these enlightened beings. And then you're going to be requesting the vows, and you want them quickly. You, 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 you give me the vows now. You're requesting the vows. Because the first one, like part A, you say uh, of the preliminaries is requesting the Lama for the vows, right? That's the one part. The second part is inviting all the Buddhas, collecting, right? Third part is not is requesting to grant the vows quickly, which is different than the initial request. The initial request is a general request. And then finally you're like, come on already, right? Come on, right? Give me the vows, give me the vows, like that. It's, a, it's different, right? And then the fourth part of that is to feel the joy to rejoice, the rejoicing. Very, very important to be rejoicing in this, these times about what's happening. Like feeling so glad in your heart about the vast amount of virtue that you can collect by acting like a Buddhist and what it will do for you and others. And then finally the Lama will ask you about obstacles, which is really they just um, before you get the vow, they're really asking you, do you really want to take the vows? Do you, do you know what the vows are? Yeah. Are you being forced into taking them? Like, is there anything about this situation that is not cool? <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> right? Um, <clears throat> do you want them? And then, once that's all clear, then we get to finally say, Nushi? Nushi. <laughs> the actual event. The actual event happens. And then, uh, and the Lama will ask you three times if you want to take the vows, and you answer three times. Um, see, the actual event is even, is like that. The actual event is just bang. Is the actual, when the vows go into your heart, or they happen in your mind? Everything leads up to that one finger snap. Boom. You got it. And then, say, juk chok. That's the conclusion. So then, the conclusion is, and, and again, you'll be reading something that's offered to you, and you're, um, you're asking the Buddhas to understand what you've just done. You know, ask, asking the Buddhas to understand that you're swearing. I'm swearing to act like a Bodhisattva so that I can become like you. So that I can, add, you know, it, it's like, a, you know, as all, as all the holy ones have done before, I will act like that. Right? As all the holy ones have done, I will so do so that I can become a holy one, like that. And you're, um, at that point, yeah, then you make, then you make three prostrations to each of the ten directions. So then there's everybody, you know, there's this big <laughs> <laughs> crazy thing. Everybody gets up and starts prostrating. And so you're prostrating to the ordinal and the cardinal directions three times in each direction and then two more times 
which is supposed to be for up and down, but you can't prostrate down and up, so you just go back and forth one more time. And that's like 10, so you're doing like 30 prostrations, right? Kind of a big circular motion. So that was the, like the first part of the conclusion. And then the second part of the conclusion is the, um, the Lama then pumps up the students, right? Gets them all stoked, about, stoked up about what they've just done. And uh, talks about how it is, like they say, that taking the, taking the vows are so powerful that they they say that you know the enlightened beings sitting on their thrones, this great earthquake goes through the Buddha paradises, and they're like, <laughs> and they're like, hey, what just happened? Like, oh, <laughs> well, Marge just took her vows, I see, right? <laughs> like that, and then and then right at that moment you become like their daughter or their son and they they take special attention they take make sure that your your path is accelerated which which may mean that you meet more irritating people <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't right this is the tricky thing you see if if an enlightened being sees oh yeah great they've taken their vows i guess they're in a hurry to become enlightened well look at all that karma they have to ripen Right, because they can see, you see, and then because they can, so they'll come down, or they'll come to you, and maybe appear to you as some big pain in the butt that you that that you needed, and it's all out of for you, so that you can draw this non-virtue out and get it, get rid of it, so that you can b become the holy being that you were meant to be, because. Once you're totally enlightened, you don't have those negative karmas anymore. They're done. Right. Yes. So explain that. Draw that non-virtue out. Well, like, let's say if you had, um, let's see, if you had a, like everyone has deep pockets of certain kinds of karma. Everyone has different deep pockets of karma. And let's just say, for example, that someone had a uh, a deep pocket of stealing, right? And they had to go through the that karmic result. Then an enlightened being may show up beside you on the bus and take your purse. And then but they're not gonna they're not gonna do that. You see you have to think you have to think that a totally enlightened being doesn't operate like that unless it's gonna be of some benefit to you. So they're only gonna do that if they know that you're then gonna process it in a enlightened kind of a way, right? You're gonna go through this process, maybe go to your lama, maybe this or that, um, and go through why did my purse just get taken from me. Um, and then you go through the karma of it all, and then you go through all the intense emotion of it all, and then this event gets purified in your mind. It's very cool. There's something very, very cool about those kinds of things happening if you put your wisdom on the line when, when things happen to you that happen to you. Your karma is happening to you. That's what's happening to you. Um, you can experience great anguish fo followed by sudden bliss that's entirely out of proportion to the situation. And that's one of the ways that you know that you're, you've purified something. It's like the, the, the instantaneous amazing relief that is blissful and then you ha you understand something's happened. You understand, right? And then, quite possibly, you'll go. That was a Buddha. Yeah, that was a Buddha that took my purse. And then, yeah, I mean, if you do your preliminaries enough, if you do certain practices enough, like your preliminaries enough, you'll always be wondering. That was a Buddha that cut me off the track today. 
<laughs> I mean, how do you want to live, right? Take your pick. So it's like a, you, you get to feel a negative emotion. Yeah. And then it's going to transform. You sit with that. Yeah. You contemplate that, and then it transforms. It so can. You can't, you, you, you can't necessarily get to that place of bliss without experiencing, oh my God, my purse just got stolen, and this and that was in it. Yeah. And then once you've dealt with all of that, then it's like, it's okay, that happened. Yeah, um, specifically in relation to like the bliss of purification, the bliss of something. You could think of the, the bliss of a negative thing being gone from your mind. Because our natural, what is our natural state, right? Our natural unhindered state is, is pure love, bliss, right? So, but most people are mired in suffering and you know, da da da. So, yeah, if you're sitting there and you're feeling the feelings, and you just continuously hold and, and just, okay, it, it can't be that person's fault that my purse was stolen. And you just you go over it and over it. And it will, sometimes it will be like easy. Other days it'll be a week long bloody battle, <laughs> right? And just be, again, you'll go in your, and then, uh, and you'll feel something just leave. And it won't be something that you decide. It'll be just the process, and then, and then there's ah, oh, and you know something just went down in your life that is important, right? Um, there's uh, that's how it happens, right? Like I had a, a major um, breakthrough years ago about money, right? Uh, I because I was trying to prove to myself that uh, money didn't come from work money can can come through work but work isn't the cause of money if work was the cause of money then everybody that worked would be would have lots of money and if work was the cause of money then if someone didn't work they couldn't have money we know that's not the case lots of people don't work and have lots of money and some people work their bloody you know self to the bone and are always broke like this and I, I was going over I was analyzing and analyzing, going over the proofs of karma and emptiness over in my mind, and something like I just described happened, and I just, I just, I went, oh my god, and I even heard this voice. Money doesn't come from work, and I knew in that moment that it couldn't be true. And then work was never the same after that. Never the same. I let go of money being wrapped to my hours at work and just went to work and served. I just served at work and didn't worry about the money. The money just, I didn't worry about the money anymore. And then it, it allowed me, it allowed me to be less selfish at work. It allowed me to like give more at work because I was suddenly excited about offering something at work versus what am I going to get for it? When really, we don't know what we're going to get for anything. All we know is that we're going to get a positive result from doing a positive deed. That's all that we know. And we know that we're going to get a negative result from doing a negative deed. That's all that we really know. And that's the power that we have in the moment. So even if your purse gets stolen and, you know, you know, it was, it, you know, you the cause of that, the karma was the cause of that, would it be, could it be from just thoughts he had that day, could it be from past lifetimes, could it be like, where it could be any of those, that's the thing about uh, one of the, you know, uh, karma, is that it ripens, there's a, there's the time gap between when you plant it and when it ripens, right, and uh, Lord Buddha said, Karma ripens in three times. Which three times are those? Thinking it. <laughs> well, no. Let's just say the result. Let's just say, okay. let's just say, a karmic result. Mm -hmm. See, a karma. Karma is any movement of the mind. That's karma. So when you're, 
when you're getting like your purse stolen, that's not karma, that's a result of karma. That's a result. So just, right? So a karma will produce a result in any one of three times. This life. This life. Life. Next life. Or any other life. Or any other life after that. <laughs> <laughs> so good. <laughs> right? Yes, life. Yes, yeah. So you could get your purse <laughs> snatched from, and that could be the result of something you did 14 lifetimes ago. Or it could be, right? It's generally, generally not going to be something you did that day. Most likely not. Right? Um, because you know, if if there was if there was no time gap, you know, n none of our good intentions could ever get answered by something negative. It it couldn't be. You know, you could never you could never come home with uh, some flowers in your hand to give to your lover, and she slaps you in the face. Yeah. That could never happen. Right. What are these flowers for? Are you cheating on me? Boom! <laughs> <laughs> right? Right? That couldn't happen if there was, if there was uh, no time gap. Right. So uh, that's one of the beautiful things to get your head around when you're thinking about the purse getting, getting taken. It's like, as you, might even have, you might even have sat down beside this person thinking, oh, this person looks lonely. You may have been like <coughs> totally motivated to help this person, <laughs> which even makes it worse. It's like, oh yeah, this person looks lonely. I'll sit down. I'm so nice. Yeah. And then, yeah. boom, all they go with your purse. Mm -hmm. You're like, what? I was being so <coughs> nice, right? So they're not connected. They're not connected. And the more you get your head around that, the easier your life will be. The easier your life will be. The more, the easier it will be to like maneuver through the highs and the lows. Question. Yes, Tanji. I'm just gonna go back a bit to yeah. the negative emotion. Yeah. Um, so the negative emotion, what I'm understanding, and I, uh, this is a bit of a break for me, is actually a good thing because that negative. Uh, because in, in my mind, I've been demonizing them. Oh, I shouldn't feel that. I shouldn't feel yeah. that. But to actually feel it and to get to the other side is where the satisfaction is, where the bliss is, where the, where the learning is, instead yeah. of just trying to resist it. So it's actually good that that comes up. Absolutely. Okay. It's it's good if you have the karma to see it as good. But it is good. Yeah. Right? Good. Yeah, and you, 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 can, you, you can sit here and clearly understand that it is good. Yeah. But you might not want to say that to somebody who doesn't understand that, right? They, 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 no, they may agree with you. Now. They I may didn't get it before. Right. Yeah. I but so now, re right? Yeah. So, and your years later, they might understand. Yeah. See, what you're talking about, um, and I'm at the risk of my head splitting open from a lightning bolt, um, <laughs> that's very much like a tantric idea. It's a very, very kind of a tantric idea. And we don't talk about those kinds of things in sutra classes, but it, in, in tantra, uh, you know, it's not this, it, Tantra is not this crazy thing where, you know, people are gathering and doing weird things. It's, it's really about learning how to use base emotions, things in your, learning how to use the things in your life as extremely hot fuel to get you out of your suffering. And if you can understand that an emotion is a result and that not only is it a result but it's it's an energy it's a because you know 
it's very possible <coughs> to feel a myriad of emotions if someone steals something from you. You know, um, it's empty. It's brought upon you by your karma. But whatever, whatever uh, emotion that you feel will be riding on some kind of energy, like a wind. And so like Tanji was saying, she can sit there and experience the blame, resentment, whatever it may be. Analyzing it, feeling it, thinking about it, that it couldn't have come from that person. And then finally seeing it as a necessary positive thing. That, that is like using everything in your life turning it around. So what you're doing is you're like you're jujitsuing like samsara. This is what you're doing. You're turning everything. You're, you're using the momentum of everything and turning it in upon itself and turning it into virtue and turning it into a way out. That's exactly what Tarnji is talking about. And it's a very, very poignant place to reach. And powerful place to reach. Um, so that was Lama Pumped Up a Students, Benefits of the Vows, and then the third part is party. <laughs> you do this big like Thanksgiving offering to the Buddhas, right? Offering to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas f for the opportunity of taking the vows, and what that means is basically pizza party. <laughs> and you know, everyone eats, everyone celebrates and has joy and takes part and says, Yeah, yeah, and we did this amazing thing. We're offering, we're offering, we're offering to ourselves and everyone else. And then finally, the Lama will do a, a little talk about not advertising your vows to people with no faith. And, you know, there'll be a talk about why. And generally, you may find this, you may have found this, I know that I did this when I first started studying anything that I study. <laughs> you know, running around preaching, right? You know, look at this amazing new thing that I just learned, and I'm smarter than you, and you should be smart as, you know, if you want to be smart, you just listen to me, right? Um, but if you run around trying to tell everybody that, hey, I just took these Buddhist vows, and I'm going to like spend the rest of my life serving people, and it's going to be so amazing, and if the person that you're telling totally disagrees with you, and like, you know, like, that it's a great benefit for you to, to act this way. And um, it's fresh. It's new and it's fresh in your mind. And then it's like you tell someone who then says to you, are you nuts, dude? Don't you know the nice guys finish last? Right? You know, no, Johnny, that's, you're too nice. You're too nice. You're too, you're, 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 you're naive if you think that's the way to live, right? So what you've done, because you weren't careful because you didn't think of them first, what you've done is you've actually created an opportunity for them to plant bad things in their mind. Because all of a sudden, they're standing up and declaring, selfishness is the way to live, right? No, John, you should be living a selfish life. You should be going, you should be working for yourself. These ideas that you have are crazy. So all that you've done is created an opportunity for them to hammer that idea inside their mind that's killing everybody. That's a and if you're if you haven't studied long enough yet and your view is a little bit shaky, you're also with your mind you're seeing someone not understand. And you know, what you don't want to do at this point is get into an argument or try and prove yourself because you might not be able to. If to prove to prove karma and emptiness to somebody, you have to know your stuff. If they don't believe in past and future lives, they don't believe, and they believe in uh, or cause you know, like causality. You know, if they believe that there's a being that is causing everything and is out of you, like if you want to try to prove karma and emptiness, you have to know your stuff really well and be able to work the conversation backwards way back into the point where you can both finally agree on one thing like oh so are you telling me that 
something good could actually be created by something negative? And if they, if, they agree, if they say, no, that's true, I guess no, it doesn't make any sense that something negative could come from something positive, then you have to start from there and work your way all the way back to say, see? Is, is selfishness, right? And you have to convince them that the way to get uh, your, your mind holy is by acting like a holy being, right? Is, is by doing a lot of virtue. So if you can't do that, if you don't have the wherewithal and the, and the skill, the skill the, then don't get yourself in hot water <coughs> by preaching, right? Leave your pulpit at home. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone will does it. Everyone does it. Gets on like this exciting thing. Yeah, yeah. They're telling all their friends, and you know, it's like, yeah. Be careful. A, nobody wants to hear it anyway. <laughs> nobody wants to hear your, you know, like if you if you like want to teach somebody, to teach them through your actions, and. Uh, like do your practice and become s become someone who looks like they've gotten some result from something, and then and then somebody will say to you, like, "What are you doing? That's giving you that glow. What are you doing? That's making you so happy. Like, why aren't you why are you angry about your stuff getting stolen? That doesn't make any sense to me. Like, why are you angry? I don't understand. Why are you always happy all the time? And then may then you're in a position. Then they're asking you for something. Other than that. You're just gonna like repel them from your practice. From any spirit, if you start going, uh, you know, I am mightier than thou. And it will always come to your, it will always come down to your motivation. You can always check it out. You know, why are, why are you saying what you're saying? Do you really want to help them, or do you really want to be somebody? And if you're honest, you'll find that you want to be somebody. <laughs> More times than not. Because I'll tell you this. When it's time for you to teach, you won't choose that time. It will just come out of you like a wind. And it, 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 it will be pure, and it will be like you didn't even do anything. And it will be perfect and right, and you'll say exactly what they need to hear. So, you know, you just got to be careful like that. It's, it's a... Uh, it can be tricky to not preach. That's class. <laughs> That's class? Really? Yeah. That was a great class. Well, thanks, Zoe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was. I know. Oh, uh, next week, I am going to be. Um, with my Lama on Main Island, but everyone is going to have the great benefit of having Mariska sub the class next week. Oh. Cool. So Mariska will teach class four, and if you want me back after that, maybe I'll, maybe, maybe, maybe I'll stay home after that. <laughs> but yeah, no, so Mariska's gonna cover for me. That's awesome. Yes, it will be. I have an announcement to make if anybody's do, do, do. interested in hearing the Dalai Lama on October 23rd. He is going to be at Thunderbird Stadium doing a teaching on 8-something, and I don't know what Worldly it is. Thoughts? No, I don't think it's the Worldly Thoughts, but anyway, it's on the website um, for <coughs> the Tibetan uh, Studies course at UBC, or there's a Tibetan. Anyway, it's a free teaching. Cool. The twenty third at Thunderbird Stadium, and I think it's a. It's not free. I think it is because he's he. I think maybe maybe the, well, there's maybe there's parts free and there's free. parts free because I was talking to my aunt about it, and she said that he never for his teachings he never charges he never wants to charge for them, but there is also um, he's doing something else with the center, um, and that's 
paint, you get tickets, you can get tickets at Ticketmaster, but yeah. I don't know, Tar yeah. I don't know exactly for sure. Tickets, so but yeah, oh, yeah, so yeah. maybe maybe I'm wrong because I just quickly looked at the website, but I didn't see anything for tickets mm -hmm. for the teaching yeah. at Thunderbird. Yeah. I could be wrong too, so don't. Well, quite quite often a, t uh, a teacher will come into a town and quite often they'll make one offering that's free. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's somewhere in there, maybe there's uh, a small section of it that's open to the public for free. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. I, I could be well, we're checking out. Yeah. Wrong. I yeah. thought yeah. you'd already done a teaching. Have I got my times muddled? Yeah, it's on the 23rd. Muddled. <laughs> yeah. Your timing is muddly. It is muddly. It's muddly. <laughs> what did you say? I thought he had already been here. Not yet. Oh. oh. Well, he has been here before. That was, that was quite a while ago. Though. Okay. Yeah. He came to do a youth conference recently. Yeah. He comes up. He, he comes. Does. Oh, okay. Here, you know, a few times. Okay. I went to the website. It looked like it was free, and when I clicked on tickets, it took me to Ticketmaster. Did it? And for it, it went teach. from two hundred and sixteen oh to forty dollars. Oh, this is at a different location, though. But it was Thunderbird. Oh, was it? Oh, was and it? then okay. he's only teaching in the afternoon, like two to three, and then there's other people teaching throughout the day. Uh, okay. So I don't know. Maybe well, there's a section I'd like free. to keep in touch over that if anybody finds out more. Yeah, anyway, that'd be great. Anyway, it would be great to go. So okay, I just thought um, we're going to wrap up class now, and Sorry, and that's okay. No, that's good. People should know about those things if they can. Um, I was just wanted to look at my homeworks from so many years ago and see, like, what the because every homework has a contemplation, right? And so this <coughs> homework, the. 15 minutes per day, visualize yourself taking the vows, review mentally the proper outer steps and the proper inner motivation. So let's just uh, close up class and we'll just do a little just do a little one. Like that. <coughs> so what we'll do is uh, I'll just lead us through a very quick little contemplation and then uh, because our eyes are closed, then I'll just uh, start the closing prayers, and then we'll just continue, and then we'll be done. So with your eyes closed, just taking a moment, And just see yourself, and even if you don't plan on taking the vows, just have fun and go through it as if you were taking the vows. So just picture in your mind, uh, it could be this space or it could be any space, but some kind of holy space and infuse it with whatever you would like a holy space to look like. It could be that you're at the top of a mountain, but picture yourself wearing all white, and you walk into this room, and everyone else that's there are also wearing white, and there's something about this white that gets this um, wind of excitement, kind of joy stirring up in your heart as you think of the idea of purity. And there's a, a holy teacher there. There's a teacher there that's going to give the vows. And as when you look at the teacher, you feel this connection with them and this excitement. And then see yourself sitting down in the room. And in your mind, 
just go over what your motivation should be. Just think about it for a minute. Why would I take these vows? What would, would my motivation be? Why are you there? What are your aspirations? Sashi Puki Jukshing Me To Tram Ri Rabling Shi Nyan De Gen Hadi Sange Shing Du Me Te Thanks for all the lovely offerings, everyone, too. Maybe we should have some chocolate. What's this? Hazelnut mousse? Mm. Let's find out. Would you like to partake of this yes. nectar? 